Hello, fellow writers. I'm Lewis, that over there is Tolkien, and you have found the Scripturian Society. Welcome back, beautiful writers. Today, we also have beautiful writer vibes in the sense that Carissa joined the meeting looking honestly like an angel today, like her hair is all down in these loose, pretty waves. And she's got this like beautiful, shiny lipstick. And I don't know what's going on with your eyes, but it's also angelic. I- yeah, I'm, I was telling Ash, I'm like, I finally figured out how to go pretty without also going goth, which is uh-huh. an enormous achievement for me. I figured it out. It is, in fact, lighter eyeshadow. Um, it's gold <laughs> instead of black. Uh, so, yeah. you know, easy solution. Should have figured that out a while ago, but didn't. And here we are. So, so I, I feel very pretty because I'm not goth. So you look very pretty. But what's that. also funny is like... If you struggle with eye makeup, so you just put it everywhere because you're thinking about your eyes. When you mm-hmm. do like lighter eye makeup, like a gold or something, like you can't tell as much if you don't do it perfectly. So it's so strange it's to me that you didn't like come across this first. You know, I 20 plus years and I finally <laughs> figured it out. That's pretty good. That's not the worst of all time so <laughs> that's hysterical well we I'm glad are. that one of us is bringing the prettiness to the table today because I was telling Carissa I haven't made any effort by the way that over there is Carissa Harlow aka Lewis and I am Ash O'Rourke aka Tolkien on this pod uh and I did not make an effort today you guys I'm sorry if you're watching this video although our internet has been so bad lately it's gonna take me a while to upload this anyways so maybe by then just imagine that I'm wearing makeup again maybe I will be mm. I'm just gross and sweaty because I go outside multiple times a day to like water all the animals and the plants because of trying to keep anything alive in the heat. So, um, but I did do my nails and they look kind of black right now, but they're not. They actually seem like very much like a Carissa color to me. They're like very dark. I feel like you like this color. I'll try and send you a picture where you can see more. They almost look burgundy in this light, but they're not. They're definitely Mm -hmm. purple. It's called Cashmere Cloud from Nail Boo. (laughs) yeah nice yep <laughs> very that cool was the sound of my chair. Yeah, ash is also wearing yeah ash is also wearing this like button up shirt and she was like should i just go full nerd and go top button yeah. and it doesn't look as terrible on you as it does on most people you look pretty good as a nerd do i <laughs> love it maybe i'll leave it yeah. i don't i feel like the, it makes a statement and that implies <laughs> that i made an effort like I didn't yeah. make the right choice, but it looks like I tried to make a choice, which is better than not yeah. making a choice. So maybe Fair I'll just enough. leave it buttoned all up to the top. It's better because I put my hair like down because it. it is unwashed and it looks unwashed. I'm not getting away with this. Like it looks unwashed. That's, That's okay. okay. So my hair looks most of the time. Um, yeah, speaking of gentle, beautiful, cloudy yes. waves you have. For today, because I washed it yesterday, but mm. I this is my story of the week and it's not even of this week. It's really of next week. Um, I called and made a hair appointment, right? This is going to get a little girly for the next couple of minutes. So all the men in the group. We love with makeup. So no one's going to be surprised. It's fair. Um, So (laughs) I haven't had my hair done in a salon since pre-COVID. And Mm. I say that and you might be thinking, yeah, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, how nice of you. You just like stay home for the pandemic. And it's Uh not that it's that someone gave me the excuse to not have to go. And I took it. I took (laughs) the not having to see people thing. Um, So I haven't been in and I, I really like my hairdresser. She's been doing my hair since high school for me. So it's not that either. Mm -hmm. Um, But all this week I have just been really anxious like stomach churning anxious for, and I, I couldn't figure out why I assumed it was the podcast because sometimes every once in a while I still get anxious beforehand. And I'm like, like I have to give a speech or something in front of people and it's not, it's just you. Mm -hmm. Um, but every once in a while I get anxious and I, I, I don't know why. So I couldn't really pin down why I was anxious. And then today I finally made a call to my hairstylist and I was like, can you get me in in the next week? And she said, yes. And I hung up the phone and the anxiety was gone. And I was like, oh, it wasn't the podcast. It was the hair. Oh, for my some gosh. reason, <laughs> it either making the phone call or getting an appointment in time was the problem I don't know because I have a cousin coming in on like the 30th and I suspect there will be a lot of pictures taken because there's Ah, a baby mm -hmm. and I'm like I want to look nice that but I I don't know why it was making me so anxious I also don't understand why I waited so long to call because both of those problems would have been solved by me calling earlier (laughs) 
So I don't, I don't know what oh it is, God. but I'm now free of anxiety. <laughs> Hooray. For the time being. I yeah. haven't gotten my hair cut in a salon since sometime around college. I think I was still in college because yeah. I cut my own hair because I feel like when you have like really mm-hmm. unpredictable hair, like really curly hair, like every like one in three haircuts is acceptable. And the other two are yeah. so bad because your hair just reacts so badly. And these are talented stylists. Like it's not their fault. Mm-hmm. My hair is the problem, but I figured out that I can trim it and layer it myself and I'm okay with the results. So I just do it myself now. That's but, good. I yeah. can't do it myself. So that's why I have to go in. Well, I've anyway. seen you try and put eye makeup on. So I feel like that's okay. Maybe you yeah. shouldn't be dealing with something sharp near your face. Yeah. Yeah. Probably not. The, so the puppies, right. We have the Bernadoodles and their hair mm-hmm. grows over their eyes. Uh-huh. So they're going to get groomed in a couple of weeks for the first time, but it grows uh-huh. over their eyes. And so we have to like pin them down and cut their eye hair because they're oh, like panted. They're like, God. why are you coming at me with something sharp? But we have you're to, like, cause cause you're blind. We can't yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh so, my God. Not my skill set. That but. is funny. Poor Winnie boy has long hair too. And I've never had like a long haired dog before. So I'm trying to just like mm-hmm. brush him because his undercoat is really thick. And right now I'm just letting him come inside like a lot. He's, was he inside right now? No, I just kicked him back outside. I let him in for a few hours because I caught him eating the cat's food. And so I was like, absolutely not. And I put him back outside in the heat. Like I feel kind of bad, but not that bad because he definitely knows. And he dug up one of my pumpkins this morning and I knew it was going to happen because I spent like my, I've actually, I used to set aside one hour for morning chores. Now I've been setting aside two hours for morning chores because there's a lot I want to get done. So it can just get growing and stuff keeps getting in the way. And so my, all of this like weedy grass was overgrowing, trying to like choke out my pumpkins because I should have just removed it all first. It's just a lot of work. So I didn't. And so I'm basically putting down this like ground cover and then I'm going to put like hay as kind of a mulch on top. First, I had to dig out Mm -hmm. all of the weeds and they grow really deep. And so I'm like hacking away at them with my little like hand uh shovel rake thing I forget what it's called and uh Winnie's watching me this whole time and I'm thinking he thinks I'm digging he he's gonna think I'm digging and he's gonna think that's what we do now and sure Uh enough I went back out there to water just before the pod and yep he straight dug a deep hole into one of my Uh pumpkins so there is no more pumpkin plant there and I'm so annoyed but Uh I knew it was gonna happen I could see the learns by ears. example. He does. Mm-hmm. He really does. Cause he'll do whatever Brownie does the other dog. And then he'll do whatever I do. Like he really, and he'll try and do whatever the cats do. He is sometimes I'm like, Oh, he's so smart. And then sometimes I'm like, Oh, he's so stupid. There's nothing going on behind those eyes. It's just yeah, like good vibes. And I've said that since he was a puppy. So I don't know. I don't know if he's really intelligent or just good vibes only and just mimicking behavior. I'm kind of inclined to think that it's mostly that. <laughs> the second, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of smart dogs, so actually something that happened to me this week that I'd forgotten about until just now, uh, the AC in our house went out uh, about no. a week ago and it was awful. It didn't really get that bad. It went out like really early in the morning. And so normally I would just kind of grit my teeth and bear it, but my mom couldn't and the puppies were here and I'm like, you know, they can't be in the heat like that. So we went over to our neighbor's house because the neighbors are on vacation and we called them and let them know and everything. And their Mm -hmm. house is a mirror image of ours, right? So Uh it's the exact same house, but the mirror image, but doors open the same way, regardless of how your house is built. Right. So we had to take the puppies into the backyard and they could tell it like, this is our house, but not our house. Right. They Uh were definitely confused. And when they went to the door to go out, we kept opening it and Luna would go to the wrong side and try to go out the side where the hinges are. And I was like, what is wrong with you? You can see that the door is opening this way. And then it occurred to me finally in our house, that is the side that she leaves to go outside on. That is the side where the door opens. So I'm like, she's so smart, but like not right. Like that's the kind of thing I would do where I'm like, this is the logical progression. If this is a mirror of our house, then the door opens this way, but also you can see it is not opening that way. And, but she's still going with what should be. And she, she's like me. So it was really funny. That is super funny. Oh, that's funny. But yeah. Anyway, the AC is fixed. So oh, it was only God. a one day thing. 
Yeah. Well, that's amazing. That would be awful. RAC was out for like uh, most of the first week that we were here. And by we, I mean me. Oh, you know what? That's infuriating because it was also the first hot week that we really had here in Texas, like the really hot week. So I was just laying on the Mm -hmm. kitchen floor with the box fan, like turned on myself and the freezer open, just sweating and sweating inside. And it was gross. And Javi was gone for that too. And he's also been gone now for like the hottest weeks for years on record. (laughs) I bet he's going to get back and it's going to be like back to like a easy breezy 90. And I'll be like, amazing, but also infuriating. I feel like that's exactly what's going to happen, but I'm almost like, I don't care. I just, he's going to come back and it's going to be the trigger. Yeah. For it to I want him back. Cooler. So then it will be cooler. <laughs> exactly. Even if I resent him for it a little bit, I still need it. So yeah, I'll take yeah. it. <laughs> just that's come so back. Funny. Yeah. I'm trying to think if yeah. uh, anything else interesting happened this week. Uh, I got to hang out with Spoons, so that was fun, aka mm-hmm. Kendall Shaw, who uh, co-hosts our sister podcast, That Pretentious Book Club, with. We hadn't gotten to hang out in person, so we went to a bookstore, and I spent way too much money <laughs> on things I don't need, but I kind of thing like, in my soul. <laughs> yeah. Like, in my soul, I was like, right. I have to have this pretty chain bookmark, and I do have to of have course. that wine glass that says what happens in the book club stays in the book club. Like I needed those Absolutely. things. I couldn't continue yeah. to live without them. And so I rationalized it to myself. And I also got two really pretty copies of some books we're reading over there this season. So I was going to get Sweet. them anyway. So that's why I rationalized that. But I texted Javi how much I spent on like books and book knickknacks. And I don't really usually spend any money privacy. And he was like, oh my God, you spent that on books. And at first I was like, <laughs> is this man just judging me because of the two of us he is the spender I am the yeah. stingy ass saver all the time so I was like right. no way in hell is he judging me nope he wasn't judging me he was concerned because my mom brought over one of her bookshelves when she moved in okay I've already filled it it's completely filled uh, mine is also completely filled that I had before and I think he's like right. there's nowhere else to put more books or another bookshelf and I'm like we will find a way do not of worry of course who needs a place to sleep? We could put a book, a book exactly. instead you of a sleep bed. anywhere. The books yeah. need a place to be. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that's great. where I'm coming from. But now I understand his concern because I was like, it doesn't track for him to be judging me over this. Right. <laughs> this does not seem like the kind of thing that would concern him. I wonder what's actually going on. Yeah, but it was pretty case. fun. And then, and then Kendall and I watched uh, the zombies movie. It's a Disney original. It is. Oh, Yes. Mm-hmm. it's something it is it's something, something. I haven't uh, actually seen it but I know what you're talking about mm-hmm. it's a commentary yeah. on racism which is really problematic because they chose actual man-eating zombies to represent minorities so yeah. <laughs> like the intent was good the execution in some ways could not have been worse so yeah it, was it is just interesting somehow yeah it, it, it's interesting how sometimes people trying to make commentary on how badly people are treated accidentally mm-hmm. make it worse yeah, like in their exactly descriptions that's they're like the here's a more insulting is. yeah there's a more insulting description for you and you're like yeah. I see what you're trying to do but also what <laughs> it's so bad that it's comical and like, yeah. there's a, a little romance in there that's really sweet and honestly the actors are shockingly good for it being mm-hmm. an original like a Disney original and also for like the story they've been given like they just all went with it and the music is really fun it's completely Gen Z <laughs> completely Gen yeah. Z so it was the dancing but it's also really fun and they're pretty good dancers so like enjoyable movie absolutely enjoyable for all of the right reasons no we spent yeah. most of the movie <laughs> screaming at the television oh my we gosh were like, no you can't say that you can't do that you have any yeah. idea <laughs> it was so funny definitely like the best like hour and a half I've spent riffing on a movie it was yeah. excellent you would have enjoyed it because we used to riff on h2o <laughs> Yes. I love riffing on movies. One of my favorite things to do is riff on books too, but you can't do that as a group activity normally. So I take movies. Yeah. Less so. And then uh, readers tend to be a little more snooty too than movie watchers. So inevitably you offend someone like significantly and then they want to have like an intelligent discourse on it. And you're like, I'm just here to riff, man. I just, I'm just here to have a good time. (laughs) Not think, (laughs) which is not usually my MO, but sometimes it is. But sometimes (laughs) when you want to riff. Exactly. Exactly. Well, what is our, uh, I was going to ask for our word of the week, but actually let's do book recs first. Do you have any book recs this week? 
I didn't read anything. Um, I reread parts of Lord of the Flies. Uh huh. <laughs> no I've already recommended. Yeah, I've uh, recommended that about a million times. Um, you know, I'll recommend something that I read a really long time ago. Have you ever heard of the Body Finder series? No. By Kimberly Durding. It's pretty cool. She hears well, not always hears, they're like echoes or signatures on dead bodies. And so she can find them. And so she helps ki- uh, track serial killers. It's is this cool. in real life or is this fiction? No. <laughs> this is fiction. <laughs> Ash, I don't think you can actually hear dead bodies. Well, I, <laughs> I mean, tuned maybe. out for a second. So for a second, I was like, is she talking about some kind of technology this person no. possesses? Because if that's no. the case, we should never be like, and they went missing for 40 years, right. you know? <laughs> No, yeah, she okay. is the body finder. It's not a machine, gotcha. um, but gotcha. they're really fun. It's four books and I read them in college and it's just fun because it's fantasy, but also there are serial killers, which is just my jam. I love both of those things. It's so. really fun because it's fantasy and serial killers. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Every, every new adult girl's favorite thing. Actually, for some reason it is. For some reason, like all like older Gen Z and millennials like on for some reason us women are really into crime and true crime and fascinated mm-hmm. with serial killers and people are really very crime. skeptical of it I honestly think what it is is that we go through so much of our lives so much of our daily life being concerned that we're going to be a victim of crime that we just want to know <laughs> essentially a much as much about it as we possibly can and I think it's also when you kind of turn it into like an entertainment thing, then maybe it's a little less scary to go out into every yeah. day because it's like, this happens to other people, which is not really the right mindset, <laughs> but is a survival mindset. Anyways, yeah, it's I better think about than nothing. Because I've been listening to a lot more <laughs> yeah. true crime lately. I go through periods where I listen to it a lot and then not at all because I've made myself paranoid. So mm. yeah. Yep. Uh, my fun. book recs this week, or uh, did I did I recommend the Guernsey Literary and Potato Pill Society? I don't think I had read it yet. No. Okay, well, yeah. I'm gonna wreck it hard, hard book wreck Yay. for the Guernsey Literary and Potato Pill Pie Society. And at first that when we got like the listener act, I was like, mm, I don't know, because I feel like they made that into a movie. And sometimes I think that people just read the book because a movie came out. And I didn't mm-hmm. think the movie looked very interesting. I didn't know much about it. But then I read this book and dude. This is, so it's a straight epistolary novel. It's all written in the form of letters. It is so good. It is like one of the best Ooh. books easily ever written. I mean, that I've not ever written necessarily, but I've read in like recent mm-hmm. years. It's really, really, really good. And I just like flew through the whole thing and it was wonderful. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to be like super like intellectually to read it. And you don't even have to be like really into historical fiction, although I do enjoy historical fiction uh, to read it. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend it for everybody. It's a very easy read. And so good and makes you think about stuff, but is also very funny because like the main character, she's so witty and she's a writer. So all of her letters are so funny to read. Cool. So heavy book rec for that. And then also I'll do a bonus book rec, which is uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. In honor of my Lewis. A classic. Uh Yes. (laughs) Yay. Um, Wait, who's the author of the other one? currency Uh, something mary ann schaefer and annie barrows okay cool yeah the guernsey literary and potato by society yeah it's good and i'm now i want to watch the movie but i think my mom will also really enjoy it so i'm trying to make her read the book so then we can watch the movie together and she's like yeah i'm still trying to finish the last book you asked me to read and i'm like yes but like parents i want to watch this movie (laughs) chop chop (laughs) job this is a book you could just fly through and I'm just trying to get her to like crack open the book because with this book you read the first letter on the first page and you're like well I have to keep reading and because it's all like a series of letters it feels like very easy to read it feels very Mm -hmm. fast paced even though not all that much actually happens you just breeze through it though so I'm like if you would just open the book you're gonna be (laughs) you're gonna finish the book right away I feel like I feel like it'd be really hard not to so one of these days uh what about our word of the week all right, our word of the week is to make sure I pronounce this right. Hereith. 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 H I R A E T H. Hereith. And it is Welsh. Um, and it is a Ooh. deep longing for something, especially someone's home or culture, and Aww. particularly Wales and Welsh people. Wow, so, that's cool. Yeah. 
I don't, I don't have like a way to use that yeah. in a sentence because it's so I know. specific. It's just, I, let's see, I came up with one. Yeah. So like she felt a particular here in a crowd full of Americans, a here for home, a crowd full of strangers, something like that. That's so, so sweet. That's pretty cool. Oh, I really like that. <laughs> Look one. all sad and nostalgic, but it's a fun word. It's, it's it good. is a fun word. No, I just really like that. That's a good one. I definitely get mm-hmm. that. I like it. It's a deep word. Uh, well, should we get into our theme for this episode? Yeah, we're going to talk about how to create backstory for your characters main, secondary, tertiary, fourth degree. I don't know so on (laughs) all your characters (laughs) what's the word it's it's not quatriary is it something like that anyway I'm gonna go with that I think it is quatriary I think you should just go with that all right I Um, mean it sounds good I know what you mean other people know what you mean so therefore it's true it sounds like a word Mm -hmm. but I don't know anyway character backstory that's what we're gonna be talking about and like how much you should know about your characters before you start and what's important to the story and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. yeah. So I, I guess it's just important to know about your character backstory, all, all of your characters, whether they're the villain or the hero or secondary characters or quatriary characters, <laughs> um, because uh-huh. that's what's going to provide your motivation or their motivation and um, make them feel real when they react mm-hmm. and engage in action and all that kind of stuff so I agree what do you think like point. uh the like five or so like biggest components to a backstory or because there's like family history oh, there's like origin mm-hmm. there's childhood experiences there's relationships I feel like a lot of people forget about like uh, important relationships but most of us are deeply impacted mm-hmm. by them even in our daily lives yeah. ongoing so I feel like that's when it's not done as much, but what do you think like some of the most important elements of a, of a thorough character backstory are? Yeah, I think definitely like family relationships, like how you were raised. If you have, mm-hmm. you know, a single parent household, a dual parent household, if you were an orphan or whatever, I think that's really important mm-hmm. because that alone does impact the way that people grow up and who they grow up to be, um, and birth order, which I, I really find birth order very interesting. So like you do. only children are very different from oldest, mm-hmm. youngest, and all of that. So just like mm-hmm. the family structure and where they are in the family structure, which is typically a very easy thing to figure out, but I think it does add a lot of layers to mm-hmm. the character just off the bat. So I think it does. Too. That's one. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree um, because like you you can like pinpoint your friends around you, even if they haven't told you, you can be like, oh, they're such an oldest or oh my God, they're such yeah. a youngest child. <laughs> or if you see them acting like a martyr one minute and then acting like off the walls the next, that there's a middle child. <laughs> That's say, what we do. I just very obviously a middle child. A hundred percent. I'm like, whoa is yeah. me, all the drama, <laughs> unnecessary drama. And then I will literally like hide under the table and talk to myself just because I think it's funny to watch other people look frightened by that. Yep, that's Ash. Yeah, exactly. That's a good uh, summary of who she is. Like, your yeah, backstory. I, I've witnessed both of those things. <laughs> yeah. Numerous I've occasions. been around for those. Oh, that's um, funny. Yeah, it does yeah. deeply make up my backstory, but that's because of like how you know, like just like the different types of pressures and expectations on siblings in different roles. And it varies by family Mm -hmm. makeup too. Cause I I do also have a lot of the elements that people would, that it's typically an older child type elements. So Mm -hmm. it just depends so much on like family backstory. But I think that's what a lot of people tend to leave out is like, those are like some of the biggest relationships that impact you. And then most people have like, whether it's in the family or not, like one or two like mentor figures who, even if they weren't like an official mentor said something at some point that has stuck with you. Mm -hmm. So maybe when you're trying to develop your character's backstory, like try and think of those things that really shaped who you are and pick some like kind of parallels for your character. They don't have to be in the same way because your character can be completely different from you, but of like the Mm -hmm. same importance, because that's something that is something that everybody experiences that shapes you very uniquely same with Mm -hmm. culture like where you grow up and if you I think another one you can think about is if you grow up wealthy middle class or or poor because any aspect of culture yeah yeah literally any aspect I think Mm -hmm. you want to like have the breakdown of is their family educated are they educated how educated how much money did they grow up with 
Uh, how do they feel about money? How do they feel about people who grew up differently? How does their family feel about people who are different? Because everybody mm-hmm. also has like very pre, like really intense preconceived notions about people who are different from them for better or for worse. So yep. they, your character will have those and your character won't be right about all of them. They might be right sure. about some, but I think a lot of that is largely based on where you come from. That's why like you can see people who grow up in more like Uh, liberal progressive cities with only friends and family who are more liberal progressive will tend to be more to that side and as conservatives will in in conservative areas with family and friends who are mostly conservative because you are so much shaped by people around you and their experiences and because there's valid points to both sides if you grow up in one or the other you'll be inundated with the Mm -hmm. valuable parts of those separate views and so you see the value in it whereas you won't necessarily for someone else so for like your story it might not meet necessarily something like that like political but it could be religious or it could be social or it could even just be like a cultural custom type thing or it could be like manners or not manners like basic Mm -hmm. etiquette is very different from place to place I think that's what builds like a well-rounded character is the tiny stuff that you don't really think about but you would notice in somebody else right away if they were different from you exactly and it's the kind of thing that's really hard to branch out and make your main character different from you in that way, because it is so much a part of who you are Mm -hmm. that a lot of times it feels like the norm or the, you know, just the way things are, but really it is a product of your culture and the region you grew up in. So kind of trying to branch it because if you have even a small cast of characters, four or five, Mm -hmm. at least a couple of them should be from a different background in some sense, whether it's family structure or culture or whatever. And it can be difficult to get into the mind space of that kind of person when you are not Mm -hmm. that kind of person. Yeah. Um, But I mean, just talking to people around you and figuring out what they're like is a good way to get around that. But you do have to very purposefully seek that out, I think, because otherwise it's just, you're going to naturally tend toward what you grew up with. Exactly. I agree. I think that's where writing professionally, there's a level of intention that's not quite there if you're just writing for fun. Like you do, Mm -hmm. you want to, you want to read books about psychology. You want to read books about like personal histories and you want to just talk to people around you. Like if you see someone who has some characteristic that you also want your character to have, Like, don't be afraid to ask that person, hey, I noticed this about you. I'm curious. I'm developing a character. Could you tell me, like, where do you think that that came from? And lo and behold, there you go. Something really raw, something really real. Obviously, don't, like, take, like, directly from their life, but use it as inspiration. Um, So Mm -hmm. just you do have to be really intentional when you're creating a character who's different from you. And at some point, you should, even if you do tend to write main characters who are like you, none of them should ever be completely like you. And you still have a bunch of other Mm -hmm. characters who also can't be the same, who need to be different. And I think you also need to cast people like uh, with different backgrounds, but without without in any way, like say, this is the right background or this is a wrong background. Like you don't want to make somebody seem like inherently more or less because of their backstory. Because it's not about that. It's about where they are going forward, like Mm -hmm. who they become going forward in the story. So I think that that's kind of important because it can be easy when you're trying to like give someone a backstory that's so different from your own to kind of cast them as like foolish or uneducated or, mm-hmm. or mean or whatever it may be. And you don't want to do right. that because that also does not set your character up for like, it's just not a very honest view of that character. They're going to feel kind of shallow because every person's backstory yeah. made them, every back, every backstory is valid in real life. So Mm -hmm. the ways that it shaped them are also valid. It's none of it is an excuse for whatever happens going forward because those those are their choices and that's the story that you're reading. But I kind of got lost in that one. But (laughs) no, that's okay. Uh, It's true that I I think a lot of times, and this is just this is everyone, but it comes out in writing a lot. um, Writers will tend to portray their own culture or worldview in really positive light and everything Mm -hmm. else in kind of maybe a negative one. And to a degree, like if you're trying to make a point about a worldview, right? If you have a religious point or a political point or just a moral point, that makes sense because you want to Mm -hmm. be discussing it. But painting people who disagree with you on small issues or just right off the bat as foolish or ignorant or whatever Mm -hmm. is 
kind of like we've said before, it's not going to reach anyone. It's going to just make those people upset and stop listening yeah. to you. And also it's going to lead to really shallow characters. So it it's just not a great strategy for yeah. anything you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. What it does is um, it just invalidates their backstory and every backstory should mm-hmm. feel completely valid. It should feel like the character is mm-hmm. a direct result of that backstory, whether the things that happened yeah. in it were good or bad. And so if you kind of just like mm-hmm. cast a character who's not like you and like a not so great light, just because they're different from you, you kind of invalidate the backstory that could have given them more power that could have made whatever change you want to see in them really impressive. So it's just something to think about because we do draw so much from everyday life. But um, Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think like, what do you think is a good place to start with trying to develop backstory for your character? Um, I I think the obvious answer is like a trauma. (laughs) Everyone kind of talks about, you know, their traumatic backstory or whatever. And Mm -hmm. I have two similar related points. I don't, one, I don't think you have to have a traumatic backstory for your main character or your Mm -hmm. secondary characters, because really the traumatic stuff should be happening in the book. That's where we are going to be most interested. That's where they're going to be most affected. The backstory is really just supposed to be there to inform the way your characters are reacting to the potentially Mm -hmm. traumatic things they're going through. And so I think giving them a trauma right off the bat, it can add layers to your character, but I think you can run the risk sometimes of making your character almost unrealistically pitiable or weak or like unrealistically strong. Like they get through every trial as though it's nothing. And that can be really Mm -hmm. annoying. Um, But on the flip side, it can be really valuable to give them a trauma because that does really inform who a person is and makes them a little easier to write a little more clear yeah. cut, a little more constant and any change that they go through really with either of these, but any change they go through shouldn't be so far removed from their backstory that they feel like a completely different character by the end. They still need yeah. to feel like the same person. So if you yeah. start them off a little more traumatized, maybe they can go through more changes over the course of the yeah. story without it feeling too far removed. Um, yeah. So I don't know, at one major event in their life that really doesn't usually define most people, Mm -hmm. but I think it can be a good place to start to figure out what might have led to that trauma and how they would have been acting afterwards as like Mm -hmm. a starting focal point. So that's kind of what I tend to do. I agree. I think also people tend to think of for backstory, like they want to give their character like one big, like wound, one big trauma. And I think maybe Mm -hmm. wound is a better way to think about it because not every character, like Carissa said, needs like a really big trauma necessarily. Because when you think of it like that with a character, you tend to think like, loss of a parent or parents or siblings or friend or near-death experience of some kind, like some kind of really big trauma like that, that we recognize from media, but most not, I'm going to, I'm going to say most because people, because I don't have the statistics, but like a lot of everyday people don't have that type of trauma. That doesn't mean that they don't have trauma of some sort, like some kind of wound. Every character should have at least one big wound that they're struggling to heal throughout their journey. It does not need to be a big trauma that you recognize necessarily though. It could literally be something that a kid said to them in elementary school that has just haunted them and that they have crafted their character around. Like that's the kind of everyday wound that people have. And it's just as valid as something that's really big and traumatic, which is why like, Mm -hmm. I hate when people try and kind of have like a competition of who's had it worse because it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter. There's no scale for that. Like it's everybody's has wounds and every wound is just as necessary for it to be treated because any wound can kill you if it gets infected and you know, like everything's important. So like, maybe think of like the littler wounds too, if you're trying to go for something Mm -hmm. more original or think if there is a big trauma, maybe think of how that big trauma leads to a bunch of other little wounds because then there's a lot more to work from Mm because it can just kind of feel flat and kind of like obligatory to just do one big trauma for your character so that might just be something to think about um yeah I mean I don't really know how else to think about that but I agree I think wound and then they typically say like you should know what your character fears and that often comes from their trauma or their wound Mm -hmm. typically and then um what their character wants the most yeah um and what your care what your character needs the most because Mm -hmm. those two things are rarely at the beginning of the story the same. Those are usually very different. And those are the things that kind of, they should kind of shift as the story goes. And that can be really difficult, but that's where you're going to pull so much of your, like your character development and even your plot from. And so if you don't have those things pretty early on in the story, 
like in the process of writing it, then you might kind of find that you're falling flat or you don't really know where to go. And so mm -hmm. that's one of the things where you might have to go back earlier and establish those if you haven't already. So it's kind of easier to just do that work beforehand. I think that's the whole point with, with, doing, with doing the work to make a backstory is it kind of saves you from having to work backwards to try and incorporate the backstory. Right. You can, it's just harder, so. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, I think um, fears, desires, and needs is a good kind of general place to start. And when I say like start with a trauma or start with a big event, I think it's just because when you pick up that event and you know what it is, it makes those things easier to answer. And it makes all of the things that come before and after it easier to answer, which is kind of weird. Yeah. So not that it has to be easy all the way, but just to make it really coherent and feel mm -hmm. like one character instead of just a bunch of different ones mashed into the same person. Yeah. Um, Cause if they've been through a trauma, that's probably going to play into their fears. It's probably going to play into their desires and their needs. Uh -huh. um, I also think it's important that when it comes, comes to all that fears, desires, needs, the trauma, it shouldn't always be an external factor acting on them entirely. Sometimes people are at fault for their own hardships mm -hmm. and difficulties. Not all the time. It depends, 100%. but I yeah, you of do Narnia. bear some Edmund responsibility. Just created yeah. all his own problems. <laughs> oh my gosh. And the problems for everyone else. He really he was did. still a very wounded child and he still went through mm -hmm. a hard time because of it. But yep. and they all felt sympathy for him, which is how you do feel when mm -hmm. someone that you care about, even if their suffering is self-created, you still feel bad. It's mm -hmm. still it's still exactly. suffering, even if they brought it on themselves. So it's okay if your characters do have caused their own trauma by making a exactly. mistake. In fact, that's even more haunting if they know that they caused it. I think that's better. And yeah. I think sometimes authors shy away from it because they think their character will be less sympathetic. And I think it tends to work the other way mm -hmm. because the idea of something external acting on you is not something you can do anything about, but mm -hmm. your own choices are things that pretty much everyone can relate to. Everyone's made yep. mistakes. Everyone's done the wrong thing and regretted it or done the wrong thing and tried to justify it to avoid thinking themselves the bad guy. And yep. so putting that kind of event in their backstory where they do bear some guilt or some responsibility for something yeah. I think makes them more relatable and more um I don't, I don't, just just a, a better character that we can sympathize with because we can feel closer to them on like a personal level in that sense so yeah I, totally um, agree. I think maybe maybe some fault into the mix would would be good because if it's a character that just everything happens to them then I I find it difficult to buy them suddenly having agency, right? Yeah. So then it just makes the story either inevitable or really boring. Yeah. So yeah, I've heard well. a lot of people say too, when you're doing characters backstory, you want to identify like a primary and then like secondary and tertiary strength and the same for weaknesses. Mm -hmm. But I don't really think that that's the way you want to put it. I think it should be more like characters, talents versus and, and interests. And you pick a few of those because those do really you know, make up how a person presents themselves to the world on a daily basis and what they feel capable and mm -hmm. not capable of. And then character flaws instead of weaknesses, because weaknesses is a little too general. Yeah. And like Chris has said, like, that's what makes a, an interesting, a believable character is the character flaws. And everyone has them. You all have things about yourselves, including us, that we would like to look back and go, I wish I hadn't done that. I know why I did in retrospect mm -hmm. is because I was dealing with X, Y, Z but it still doesn't make it right. Mm -hmm. And I wish I hadn't, your character should have that too. Like some people struggle with telling the truth more. Um, some people that's like a problem that they have. Some people struggle with mm -hmm. pride and that's more of their issue. Like if you mm -hmm. really need to go back to like the seven deadly sins and pick, pick one of those yeah. and then go find like a little branch off of that. That's a good way to go. If you don't really mm -hmm. know where to start, but if you look around you, you can probably see like, I think it's always best for this kind of stuff to look at the people that you care about and to look for the things in them mm -hmm. that might be a character flaw because you know that person and you love them anyways. You can empathize with them yeah. anyways, despite the fact that you see that flaw in them, that it's kind of a bad habit. Right. So you can use that for inspiration for your characters too, because then it'll give you more empathy for your characters as well. So being like, well, that character has a lying problem and that's just despicable because there's mm -hmm. a lot more complexity that goes into why somebody habitually lies. It could be because they developed it as a habit to protect themselves, or it could stem mm -hmm. from pride if that's like another part of their issue. So like you, yeah. you, you want to understand it all, but if you go with stuff that you're familiar with from people that you care about, you might find that you're more understanding of the flaws than you would be to just yeah. a stranger. Right. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the key is to make all of those strengths and weaknesses or flaws and 
strengths that you called it, um, put them all together in a person where those things make sense together or mm-hmm. cause conflict that make right? you want yeah. someone's flaws and strengths to be motivating them and playing into the story you're trying to mm-hmm. tell. So I do think that somewhat when you're creating a character backstory, particularly for your main character and for your villain, but also for secondary characters, mm-hmm. you want to make sure that the backstory you're giving them is going to become relevant to the story you're trying to tell. You don't want it to be so contradictory that it <clears throat> that it loses its importance. Um, I, I see that this kind of happens a lot of times in middle grade stories or in urban fantasy <clears throat> where the character will kind of get thrown into the new world and then their whole old life is just gone and there's no yeah. reference to it and there's nothing about it. And that can be really annoying because if you're a middle grade person or a teenager or even just a person reading that, it, it's difficult to imagine that you would just abandon all of your friends and abandon mm-hmm. all of your family for this. Yeah. And I don't think that's a realistic way that most people would go. Yeah. Um, so making sure that the backstory plays it. Don't give your main character a best friend that isn't going to be relevant later, right? They can just yeah. be a person with a lot of friends, but none of them are super important. They're not important enough to drag into the plot, right? A good yeah. example of this is um, the City of Bones, the Mortal Instrument series by Cassandra Clare, right? Clary has mm-hmm. a best friend, Simon, who is not magical like she is, but he gets dragged in with her because they are best friends. Mm-hmm. And it's not just like this random character that she sometimes thinks about or a character that is thrown yeah. in with no purpose to the story there yeah. there's purpose to their friendship their relationship and the way the story is going to go um there's yep. purpose to her mother and her backstory and all of that and so whatever details you give you can know more details than are necessary for the story but when it comes to yeah. sharing the details with the reader it needs to be a detail that is going to come back later or something that is playing into uh informing the way that they're going to act um or something like maybe they have a little sister and that little sister isn't mm-hmm. important, but it means that they then make a sacrifice for a small child later on because it reminds yeah. them of their sister, right? Like Katniss in yeah. the Hunger Games. Yes. Um, and exactly. you, you want to kind of make sure that that backstory is feeding into the actual story you're telling, not mm-hmm. totally irrelevant and not the whole of their being. They still have to change. They still have to go through um, realizations and growth and all of that. And yeah. they, they have to be compatible traits and backstories. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. Um, I think to that point in multiple ways, I think, uh, I'm going to try and remember, um, both of the points that I wanted to make, cause you've mentioned both of them Sorry. briefly. No, 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 you're good. Cause you mentioned them both. I was like, Oh, I want to say that, but I don't forget. Mm-hmm. Um, I think to the idea of like, you know, character talents, interests, or strengths and flaws, weaknesses, like Krista said, they do tend to tie in together. Like, I mean, if you think mm-hmm. about it, um, growing up, I was always told that I was a good communicator. I was a good, you know, I was good at that. And so what did I go into? What did I put all of my effort into studying and bettering myself in, into writing and speaking? And so that's what I pursued. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that leave behind? Um, Math and science? I'm not, I'm actually not horrible at science. I'm really bad at chemistry. I'm really bad at math and Mm -hmm. chemistry. Like you can't have everything and neither can your characters. So like, that's like a really like skill set way to think about it, but your character should have that as well. But like, it's the same Mm -hmm. with the character traits. Like maybe if you're a really good communicator, you don't feel like you also need to necessarily be like the most empathetic person because you're like, well, communicating is my strength. Or maybe you feel like you don't need really need to also be a leader because you're a communicator. So like, however your character identifies themselves, there's going to be some other side to that, that it means that they don't identify as. And it actually doesn't mean that they're not good at that or couldn't do that well. It means that they think that they're not good at that. And so that's, I mean, that's like a, a pretty, I feel like easy way to if you're trying to like build a character's backstory, like use what you have and then look to the opposite of it for either strengths or weaknesses. What's left behind. Yeah, exactly. Think about what's left behind. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, (laughs) I think so. Think about what's left behind. Um, I think also, like you were saying, you don't necessarily need to use all the backstory you develop. In fact, I don't think you should Mm -hmm. use the backstory you develop, but you should develop it. And that goes for your secondary characters too. And it can feel like they're not as important, but you never know if you're going to want to make them more important later in the story or in the series. So you're never going to know if you wanted that there and they would have been more consistent if you had developed their backstory in advance. So regardless of the character, obviously your main character's backstory should be more thorough than the others because they're who you 
focus most of your time on. But you're going to have ideas to change that backstory a little bit here and there anyways as you go. And also, the only way to communicate all of that would be through like info dumping at some point. And you don't need mm-hmm. to because when you right. meet somebody in real life, you don't get all of their backstory at once ever. And you could know somebody... Yeah for years and years and years. You could be married to them for your whole life and you could st- you'll could you still learn things about them. That is the way that people are. And so there is never any point in time where you need to tell your readers all of your character's backstory. Instead, you just right. drizzle in the details as they're relevant to the plot. Because if you've done your backstory correctly and you've created a plot that will force your characters to develop, then you will be bringing up moments where backstory becomes relevant naturally yes so just don't ever force backstory in it will come up naturally and if it's not then you might need to change your plot to put more pressure on your characters internally Uh, otherwise it's just going to be forced and no one likes that yeah you don't want to make it clunky because too a lot of times backstory will feed into the main story and you want to sort of be able to see where it's going. You don't want to give them so much information that by the time you make a big reveal, they're like, oh yeah, I kind of remember that being part of the backstory. You want it to stand out as the thing that was worth mentioning so that when it comes around, the reader remembers and it's a reveal and it's surprising. It's like, oh my gosh, that was so cool. Like, see how that came around instead of them having to think back and say, oh yeah, I guess I remember that being mentioned in this big info dump. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of backstory will be delivered, not even directly, kind of like how you can know somebody in your friend group and say, oh, they're such a middle child without them ever having Mm -hmm. to tell you that. So a lot of whenever you can do unspoken versus spoken, I think that's excellent. And backstory is tends to really naturally come through that way. That's why if you do in all of the work to develop your character's backstory in advance, you'll have it in your head. So the way you write your character will naturally reveal some things contextually that readers will assume about your character's backstory, which is the most natural way to learn about someone's backstory, because that is typically how we learn in real life about someone's backstory. Maybe not specifics, but we get a pretty good sense you can get a pretty good sense of what someone's been through, at least in some ways, just by the way that they speak and the way that they act and the choices that they make. So that's where Mm -hmm. the bulk of communicating your character's backstory should come from. And then if you want to communicate like a specific wound or something, then maybe you have that, you know, come to a head at some point in the book where it has to be Mm -hmm. expressed verbally. But other than that, yeah, I would say mostly try to communicate just you, the reason you develop the backstory, so you know it, So you as the writer know what it is, and then it will naturally filter into the story. And and that's really the whole point of knowing the character backstory. I feel like this is true of so many things in writing. It's that when you you have that iceberg, right? When you know everything Mm -hmm. that's below the surface, everything above the surface just becomes so much clearer. And readers can kind of get a sense of things without ever having to actually be told that thing. And you are going to know your characters on a deep enough level that their choices really feel inevitable or easy to predict for you, not necessarily for the reader because they don't know everything, but you are going to know, okay, they're in this tough situation. What would they do? And because you know all this stuff about them, it's easy for you to know what they need to do. Um, And so that's just, that's just going to make your life easier as a writer and also make it richer for readers because it's all going to make sense and be very coherent together I agree um, and I think for yeah, secondary think characters also, particularly oh, sorry I was just saying I think for yeah. uh for secondary no, characters particularly you don't want to spell things out like you for them yeah. you really want to let their backstory speak through their behavior and actions and personality because otherwise it's like mm-hmm. wait are they a main character and it's very confusing because typically in a story you want to be focused on the main character it's whether the main character um if it's right. like six of crows where you have like six very prominent characters then maybe throughout the series you get into more of their background explicitly but if that's not your scenario with like six characters who are equally important and you get multiple perspectives then that you don't really have an excuse to do that you still want to know it for you but you don't need to spell it out if it's a background character or like a side character or whatever right Um, I think another good strategy for like revealing things, it's going to depend on what the backstory is. And this is mostly for if they do have a very specific trauma in their background. Um, I think over the course of the story, you can do a lot of hinting instead of blatantly stating. Mm -hmm. So my, my big example of this is the darkest minds, because, you know, I love this book. And Mm -hmm. if you read it, you know that there are all these hints for 
the first half of the book that something happened to Ruby, our main character, before she ended up in Thurmond, which is like the camp that she was in. Something yeah. happened before then that sent her there. And it's yeah. traumatizing and she doesn't like to think about it, but she has kind of these fears and insecurities related to it. And we don't know specifically what it is, but mm -hmm. as time goes on, we start to sort of get a sense of what it is. Something, oh, it's something that happened with her parents. It's, oh, it's something connected to her power and that kind of stuff. And then yeah. there's finally a moment when we hit this big climax. It's like a, it's not the biggest, it's not the end climax, but it's a climax toward the middle when Ruby finally reveals what happened and it's that she erased yes. her parents' memories, right? And you're and like, I should have known the whole time. <laughs> right. Yeah. And she reveals this and you feel you've been given all of the details throughout that the story really makes sense. And as you're reading it, it is kind of technically an info dump, but as you're reading it, you're clicking with all these details mm -hmm. that came before. And it's a really satisfying yeah. moment for the reader because you're like, oh, I remember when she hinted at this and you're filling in all these pieces of the story. And that can be really fun. It only works if you have like a big trauma in their background that's really mm -hmm. relevant to the main yeah. plot. But if you do have that hinting it, you don't have to give the backstory up front. You can hint at it and reveal it later when it becomes mm -hmm. most relevant and so that's it's all better. in the reveal that's yeah, yeah exactly totally a lot agree. of it is in how you reveal it so yeah. that's and and if you don't have a big trauma you can still hint at things that happened in their past don't say they're a middle child like you said hint at that and their behavior yeah. and the way they say oh yeah my older brother used to do this and my younger brother used to do this so you kind of figure out okay they're in the middle well, yeah they're um, in the instead middle, of them exactly. blatantly announcing it yeah. Yes, uh, exactly. So I, I think hinting can be really good, particularly with secondary characters and particularly when you're in third person. But I think it also in with main characters and in first person, I still think there's a lot of value in hinting over telling. Yeah, so. I, I think you should, you should communicate backstory primarily through hinting. And then you pick like one or two of the most important elements that you want your readers to remember about your character's backstory. And those ones you can be more explicit with. And the reason it works, yeah. so work, it works so well in Darkest Minds is because Alexander Bracken didn't just like give you a bunch of hints necessarily. It was almost like, like she had picked from the beginning which element of her character's mm -hmm. backstory she was going to reveal explicitly. And then she yes. gave like straight puzzle pieces. Like these were solid puzzle yeah. pieces throughout the story True. that basically added up all together to this big reveal. So when it happened, it felt completely natural because it mm -hmm. was it was being done intentionally from the beginning. Like this was the big backstory thing she was going to tell us from the beginning. And so that also yep. can help because some stuff you want to hint at and some stuff you want to build to. I feel like she built to that. Some stuff you don't need to yeah. build to. You can just drop some hints in like, you know, birth order type stuff and strengths and weaknesses right. type stuff. So definitely. Yeah. Um, and I think too, you, you talk about intentionality and whether or not you are a plotter or a pantser, right? Someone who plans everything out versus someone mm -hmm. that kind of just flies by. Suit they also pants. call it a discovery writer. Yeah, yeah. You Ooh, that uh, sounds better, learn but as I don't you like go along. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's not as easy to say a plotter versus pantser. Um, so whichever one you are it can work. It's just that you plotters do the work at the front end and pantsers do the work at the back end. Mm -hmm. um, you're gonna have to do the work eventually. So yes. I. I, for me, character backstory is usually the thing I know going into it. If because mm -hmm. I'm kind of in the middle, I do a little both. That's kind of the thing that I think is mm -hmm. most helpful to know going into it. Because as you you know write it, if you do plan that out, you know how to inform your character's decisions. Yes. But you can also do it the other way around, where you need your character to make certain decisions. And so you write it that way and then you go back later and say, okay, well, this is their backstory that would fit the kind of person that makes these choices. Yeah. Um, but then eventually you have to go back and kind of do an edit and go through it with the backstory in mind yeah. um, at least once because there are little places you're going to find where you can hint at things or provide puzzle pieces or mm -hmm. little, even just little quirky things from their background. Like it doesn't all have to be super relevant. You just don't want to clunk things up. Yeah. Um, so they're just, you're going to find little places to add details like that to make your characters feel more real. And yeah. so whether or not you do that, pantsing or plotting is fine. You just have to do it at some point in the process. 
Yeah, I agree. So. I think if you are someone who is more plot driven, like in your writing style, then it might be easier to do your backstory work up front because it will inform the plot before, instead of you making the plot and then having to go back and sure. try and weave the character's backstory relevance into it. But if you're more character focused, maybe you just write the whole book because you just know the characters so well. Like you're just like characters come right. to me so easily. I don't even have to think about it. I know who they are. And then you go back and you drop in the hints because you're like, okay, that's easier. I mean, that's just, right. I would assume that that's probably easier for, it's probably more about if you are a plot driven writer or a character driven writer for like what's easier to mm -hmm. do, but you can do it either way. The idea is that it should be intentional though, because if it's not intentional right. and you don't, you don't make the effort to go back or to weave it together with backstory involved, it just won't be as good as a book that is, that was done with intentionality. Like it may be right. good, but it won't be as good as it could be. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Um, cause you can learn about characters as you write them. I think this is probably more common for secondary characters because I, I don't think we just put as much effort in secondary as the main character, which makes sense and is fine, but you get to know them along the way as you see how they behave when things happen to, and because of the main character mm -hmm. and learning along the way, it's kind of like getting to know a person in real life. You don't have this info dump to work with. You're just learning as you go along. So I think that can be a strength, giving yourself the freedom to allow your characters to make choices instead of kind of boxing them into the backstory makes a lot of sense, but eventually it's, it's gotta be more on the more concrete side and that can yeah. be on draft one or draft 10, but it's gotta be sometime before you publish. Yes. A hundred percent. My dog is like shoving her face into my hand. And she even like kind of distantly hear my... Yep, they're there. Oh, they are. <laughs> um, Aurora. Animals. Um, oh, and then my last point is, <laughs> anyway, um, you want to give your characters, for the most part, unless it's really relevant to your story that they had a miserable childhood, you want to give them fun memories too, and yes. like quirky things and joys that they've had, good relationships, not just mm -hmm. bad ones. Um, I, I don't know. I can't speak for everyone, but I would assume that everyone has at least some things from their childhood that were happy, some things that were good. So yeah. even if they were in kind of a bad situation, give them something to lean on. Um, mm -hmm. because I think that will inform again, it's all about just informing what's happening in your actual story. Um, but you want good things to be informing them, not just bad things. I agree. Well, that's it's how just people like, work. It's like without the dark, you wouldn't see the light kind of thing. Like you wouldn't know mm -hmm. what it is. It's kind of the right. same. I mean, I think everyone has had something good happen um, just because statistically, surely it's impossible for, for yeah. something good to everything have never happen, for everything to suck <laughs> yeah. all of the time, even if you had mm -hmm. a super rough childhood. But that's how you get through it. And that's how you know the difference. That's how you can look back and say, yeah, I had a bad childhood because I can remember the, like, I can remember what good stuff was and it was mostly not mm -hmm. that. But so you do tend right. to have like a few shining memories. Like maybe someone said something nice to you. Maybe you had a really great friend at some point when you were a kid, maybe you had like the perfect day at the beach and you just always think mm -hmm. about it. Like whatever it is, like yeah. there was something, maybe it was just, you really enjoyed the way the sun like hit the grass in the morning and you could smell the dew on the grass, like whatever it is, yeah. like everyone has had something beautiful happen. And for a lot of people, I think people who have been through trauma tend to hold on to those moments even more so. And so if mm -hmm. you do want to give your character a really big trauma or really uh, troublesome past, then maybe whatever moment is for them, that is their happy moment. Maybe it's something that they reflect on a lot uh, because you do typically have to have something to hold on to, to get through really intense yeah. trauma. And if it's someone whose life has been like mostly chill with just some inner wounds, they should still have really prominent happy memories. Cause that also builds your character, not just the bad things that happened to you, but maybe it doesn't yep. have to be as like almost obsessively returning to the idea as if with a really intense trauma. But I do right. think that if we had that more, that returning to like some happy memory, more like almost as a habit to try and keep yourself going as a character, I feel like that that would actually like counterintuitively actually increase the impression of the trauma and how it affected the character. So totally. 
because you you want to be dragging things from the backstory into the main story when it's most relevant. And so when they're good things and happy things, that's probably what's motivating your character, maybe even more than the dark things, because your character can have motivations like vengeance, but that doesn't mean anything unless there's hope that that vengeance will achieve something, right? Mm-hmm. They think that they're making a better world for other people or that they will yeah. get to live in peace or something like that. So yeah. there has to be some kind of good memory motivating you. Otherwise it's mm-hmm. hopeless and there's no motivation to do anything. There is no desire. There's just yeah. eating and sleeping and not dying today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, which, which won't get you very far. Isn't a so. lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you want to, make sure that your characters are motivated at least by a little of both, but maybe even primarily by the good instead of the bad. Because if you're motivated to protect someone or you're motivated to live out a dream or something, those are light things. Those are good things, fond things that are probably informed by good things in your past. Mm-hmm. And again, even something like vengeance or world domination or whatever it might be that's a little more of a negative goal, that's still based on the precedent that you can create something better, that there will be hope at the end of that tunnel. So you have to give your character some hope. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think a lot of characters are either motivated by wanting to achieve something, some happiness that they had once. So to achieve Mm -hmm. it again, and then maybe expound upon it, or to achieve something that they see that somebody else has, which tends to be more of a villain's motivation, but we all have at some point, like you see someone else is so happy in a situation. And so we try to mirror Mm -hmm. some, we try to mirror the behaviors that we think will get us to that same goal. Cause we want to feel that way. We want to feel that happy. That tends to be less of an achievable path. So if that's the way that your character is going villain or not, like they should have some struggles there, but I think a more, yeah, um, they might be going about it the wrong way. Yeah, exactly. And typically whatever happiness like you or your characters choose to pursue, whether it's trying to return to a good memory that you had and trying to recreate that, or whether it's trying to get something someone else has, either way is actually kind of a lost cause. But your characters don't have to Mm -hmm. realize that at first. They could realize that a lot later because nothing will ever be the way that it was again and nothing will ever be the way that you imagine it to be. So neither of those things are possible, Mm -hmm. but they are extremely motivating as ideas. So your characters should have those ideas, but the story I do not think should live up to either of them because that is not, that's just not how life works. But it is what will get you through the day. Right. They, they need to go about it maybe in the wrong way or a way that isn't ultimately going to pay off, but that's yeah. still the motivation. And so it's still relevant to their backstory or their story informed by the backstory. Yeah, so. exactly. And like, maybe like the end, it's not what that they had always imagined for themselves, but it's something else that's even better. Like I think about um, mm. the end spoilers for the shadow and bone series, the end of ruin and rising yeah. Mal and Alina do end up together and so we're like yay this is what I think Alina's you know kind of wanted the whole time she had to come to realize that that's what Mm -hmm. she wanted but the whole from the very first book she just is thinking about her childhood memories with Mal and how when it was her it was just her and Mal things were so good and so so much of her wants to return to that and Mal too but it's just not possible and so Mal gets really moody and obnoxious for a lot of the series because he's just so bitter Mm -hmm. that it's not something that he can have again like that and then at the very end they do end up together and so they do end up with kind of what they both wanted, but it looks different. Like she's a very changed person. They run an orphanage. So these are good things, but they're not mm-hmm. exactly the way that either of them imagined. And I think that that's right. the most realistic kind of resolution you can give to something like that. And it all stems from your character's background and from what it is that what made them happy, what didn't, what they want to avoid, what they want to achieve, and then whatever decisions they make trying to achieve that and then achieving something that in the end is better for them, but it's not maybe right. exactly what they were going for this whole time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess my last point, I don't know how many you have, but my last point is that it can be good. I don't think it's necessary, but it can be good to do like one of those character questionnaires for your characters mm-hmm. um, where you go through like favorite color, favorite food, all that kind of stuff. I don't know if that stuff is really going to become super important to your book, but it can be really helpful for you getting to know a person. It's kind of Mm -hmm. like, I assume dating goes, right? You ask kind of the shallow questions first to get to know, like, kind of if this is going somewhere, because in Mm -hmm. the way that they answer and the way they converse with you, that's actually giving you more information than the answers themselves. 
And so if you want to do the character questionnaires, they're, they're certainly fun. I like to do personality type quizzes for my characters and answer them yeah. the way they would. Mm -hmm. um, and that That's can kind of idea. give you some insight. Yeah, um, it's fun and kind of a guilty pleasure, but it does also help you inform your characters. And so think about what might make them a you know, introvert versus an extrovert. Is it nurture versus nature? Is it a little of both? Is it mm -hmm. birth order? Is it whatever? And yeah. just starting with those little details can also help because they eventually lead to big details. Um, so if mm -hmm. it feels like really overwhelming to try to come up with a backstory, just start with kind of the questions you would ask on a first date, I guess. <laughs> yes. No, hundred percent. advice to anyone. <laughs> yeah. Well, cause it's like small yeah. talk, like you're just getting warmed up mm -hmm. to kind of getting to know them. And right. it is, it is super, even to me, it is still so intimidating to sit down and actually like try and write out some of a character's backstory. Uh, I like the idea of the mm -hmm. personality quizzes, because I feel like that's another way, like yeah. you get to know, um, like yep. you can totally like you used to like you do that you take them with your friends and you get to know more about your friends when you see their results right. and yours but it's in a more it's like in a yeah. slightly less intimidating way than being like tell me everything about yourself um but then right. yeah also like favorite color favorite food all that stuff is not necessarily going to come up in your story unless you're trying to show that another character knows that character so well that they know those things which is interesting right. but unless you're having something like that then not most likely that's not going to come up um, unless you're using it to inform like, oh, she wears this, she tends to wear the same color of clothes or most of her clothes are somewhere mm -hmm. in this color scheme, you know, stuff like that. Um, right. but it can just, like yeah, it can quirks. help you. Yeah. It can help you just warm up to things. Um, mm -hmm. there's a lot you can look up to if you don't, if you still don't know where to start with that, you can literally look up, um, character backstory worksheets and just download them or take a picture or whatever, and just fill out the ones that are the ones you have answers to. And if you don't have answers, mm -hmm. go and talk to the people that have aspects that you'd like to see in your main character. Talk to them about what it is that yep. makes them that way. I mean, I think that that's yep. a great way to do it. There's a lot of other resources for working on backstory than just sitting down at your computer and staring at the keyboard like, God, True. this is such <laughs> a big task. Like, be creative yeah. with it. Mm -hmm. For sure. That's pretty much um, all I've got. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, sweet okay well how's writing been going for you this week <laughs> good um I'm really excited I was already really excited but I'm still working on my Lord of the Flies retelling mm -hmm. uh remix retelling just feels weird to say now because I've always been calling it remix anyway it's super good um I so two things one I've kind of realized that I've decided that in the prose, I'm going to start making like Easter egg references to other classics, um, which I'm super excited about. So I have a couple of like Alice in Wonderland references, like down the rabbit hole and mm -hmm. like Moby Dick and Dante's Inferno and that kind of stuff. And like my hope is maybe hopefully that teenagers specifically, because a bunch of people read YA, but really the target mm -hmm. audience is teenagers. The teenagers in high school, like in high school, will be able to read it and see those because they're really fresh off the cl reading classics mill um, right. and be able to say like, oh, I remember this from Dante's Inferno or, hey, I wonder if this is kind of like in Romeo and Juliet and that kind of thing. Because I just think that would be fun. It, it makes the classics more fun to read. And it also, I think, will add a layer to this book that high school students would be able to really relate to. So I'm That's kind of excited adorable. about that. It happened mostly on accident. I know I'm excited. Um, so there's that. Also, my favorite scene in The Lord of the Flies, and this is going to sound really morbid, but my favorite scene in The Lord of the Flies is when Simon is talking to the pig head and oh like, you know, it's indicating that he's about to die. <laughs> and then, you know, Simon goes down to the beach and he dies. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I got to write my version of that scene today and it was really Ooh. good. I did kind of a line by line thing in their conversation. Um, and I, I'm kind of mixing up who dies. Like, you know, you want to mix things up with retelling. So it's yeah. kind of like, you think it's going to be this guy, but it's this other guy. <sighs> um, so I'm just, I'm really excited about the way it turned out. I think it's probably the best scene I've written so far. And I finally got into this groove where I feel like I have the voice of the story. I think it's mm -hmm. partially because now I am kind of filling in certain classic Easter eggs, but also I just feel mm -hmm. like my sentences are coming together so much better. Yeah. I've been writing sentences and like sitting back and being like, 
dang, that's a good sentence. That's really, you know, beautiful or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just kind of hitting my stride. I think I'm definitely three quarters of the way or uh, more done. So that's usually when I start to hit the best part. Um, I'm kind of over that hill, but Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just, I'm extra excited about it. That's so. super exciting. I told Kendall you were working on a Lord of the Flies retelling and she mm-hmm. got so excited because she's also I working know. on a retelling right now, which I didn't yeah, know Yeah, she texted me. Yeah, yeah she was like, hang team. on, I have to talk about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she's doing a Midsummer Night's Dream uh, retelling right now is what she's working on. I'm just like, you guys yeah. are so brave over here doing retellings. That just sounds like <laughs> so much work and I'm just, mm-mm. It is. <laughs> Not I. But it's, I think it's going to be worth it. I'm really proud. <laughs> It will be worth it. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to read both of y'all's retellings because you're taking like two stories I already really enjoyed and you're making them into even more of the genre that I really enjoy. So exactly. That's what I want to do. I just want to make every classic a fantasy. That's all Mm -hmm. I want. I also want I love classics, but I wish there was more magic. Yeah. Would you do it with the Charles Dickens perhaps so that I could perhaps enjoy Charles Dickens? You know, Ash, I'm not going to lie to you. I've never read Charles Dickens, so I would have to actually read one. Um, Which one should I read? What is the best one? Um, Let's see. I don't know because I don't like it. So ask Kendall. (laughs) I don't like (laughs) Charles Dickens It's Kendall that likes it. I think he's long-winded and boring. That's right. This makes more sense. Um, Because that is like, again, okay. Because this is one of the things I kind of want to do is I feel like there is kind of this dwindling love for classics and like it's fine Mm -hmm. if you don't like to read classics there's not there's nothing wrong with reading classics and there's nothing wrong with not reading classics Mm -hmm. but I think sometimes the reasons that people don't like classics they tell me and I'm like I can fix that I can (laughs) I can take that out I can Mm -hmm. I can make it a little more fast-paced I can put fantasy elements into it right because it's the story and not necessarily the things that people typically complain about that I like about them yeah so I don't know. I just, I feel like there's a lot of potential there. And I kind of want to bring back teenagers love of classics because they have to read them for school anyway. And I think they should have to, but maybe there's a way to make it more enjoyable for them. And so just taking classics and putting them in like a modern setting slash also fantasy and maybe a little bit of horror. I'm not saying that's going to be my thing, but I'm saying it's something I like and I'm excited about doing at least once. That's definitely (laughs) good. I think for Charles Dickens, there've been a ton of adaptations of A Christmas Carol and Oliver. So people have tried to adapt those, but I don't, we're reading great expectations this season. So I don't know how that's going to go. I had to read some of it for school, but I don't remember it at all. I Mm -hmm. I, I remember thinking this is very sad and long and that's all I remember. If you could bring to me a love of Charles Dickens, I definitely did too. Uh, I think Spoons would be very appreciative if you could bring that back for me and the teenagers. The dog is over here causing as much sound as she possibly can. She just clawed my leg. She's scratching herself and shaking her collar. Do you mind? We have like two minutes left. (laughs) Skedaddle. (laughs) Anyways, um, the cat is just watching her threateningly and the dog hasn't noticed yet. (laughs) Yo, no more scratchies. I know I gave you flea medicine last week. Oh my God. Um, You're fine. (laughs) She is. Girl, girl. This is unnecessary. She's still scratching. Okay, it's fine. Um, let's see, my writing updates are I I've had it on my list and I've been shaming myself every day because I've been too busy to get back to rewriting. But like I said, I had made a lot of progress before. So a lot of what I'm gonna have to do now is go like cut out a ton of stuff that's not really relevant anymore. But also, you see, I got maybe I can still do that part and at least go in and cut some stuff out. I, I saw these two books that I really want to read. They're nonfiction. I don't mm-hmm. usually read them, but they're about like, like yeah. human theory, philosophy, behavior type stuff. And I yeah. and like a, and like historical cycles and like political cycles and stuff. And I cool. really want to read them before I completely finish the next go through of the book, because I'm like, I suspect, because I'm already doing kind of like a, like a theme in here where like what's, what is actually true and not true and how can you turn people against each other type thing, stuff that we are all actually Mm -hmm. fairly familiar with these days, but I'm giving it like a fantasy angle so that it's like refreshing and not just like, oh, this again. But anyways, (laughs) I feel like I've not been approaching it. I feel like it's, my approach has been kind of too wishy-washy. Like, I don't know what I think about it, which isn't true, but it's that I have yet, Mm -hmm. I have yet to understand the issues well enough to translate them to this world. Right. 
And so I got these books and I'm so excited. They should get here any day now. And so I'm going to read the books. I think I'll still go through and do some cuts because I think I can still do that before I read the books. And then I have to go through mm-hmm. anyways, again, in detail, because I have two whole pages of notes, like go back and add this in, add another reference to this, make sure that you have prefaced yeah. this and stuff like that. So I have like two <laughs> right. whole pages of bullet points for that. So I'm already going to have to go mm-hmm. back in and do like really in depth. So I, my hope is by then I will have read these books or at least most of these two books. And then I will be able to go in and, um, and just adjust it. So it feels a little more intentional. So it's cool. progress, but like not a lot of progress. I, but I did like go out of my way to like buy these two books on the subject, which mm-hmm. doesn't sound like a lot, but I don't like to let go of my money. Like I'm very as much yeah. a saver. And so it feels like a really big sacrifice that I'm like, I spent this money on myself and it wasn't for the pod necessarily. It's just because I wanted these books and I think it'll make this book better if I understand these issues in a more concrete way. So mm-hmm. I'm excited about it also because it means I have to new books coming in the mail. Hooray. And nowhere to put them. It's always exciting. Yeah. (laughs) Yay. Even better. (laughs) Hooray. So that's pretty much my Uh, update. Well, cool. It is fun. I, I, I get a shocking amount of enjoyment out of reading a nonfiction book every once in a while. It can, it can be pretty cool. So I have a lot on, um, I have a lot of nonfiction books about, um, the possibility of extraterrestrial life like a lot of books on that. That does not uh, surprise me, Ash. <laughs> I know. It's not surprising that I'm really interested in that. I also have a couple books mm-hmm. on like uh, cryptids because I think cryptids are very mm-hmm. interesting. So, uh, and now I'm going to have these books and I'm not going to tell anyone which cool. ones they are yet because I haven't read them yet and I don't know if they're good or not, first of all. And also then, because I don't want to give anything away about right. what I'm trying to like pull into my theme. I feel, uh, before I fully, I mean, I think I fully established my theme but I want to see how it turns out when I put this more like concrete spin on it. So anyways, nice. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, let's see. So if you guys want to keep up with us during the week, you can certainly do that. You can follow us on social media. We're on TikTok and Instagram. We are the Scripturian Society. Uh, go to Instagram for your daily writing advice, um, stuff to just keep you motivated throughout the week. TikTok has got funny videos, plenty of them for writers, all courtesy of Carissa, aka Catherine, aka Lewis. Uh, if you guys want to support the pod, you can totally do that. You can go to StorySirenStudio.com. That is our website. We've got a lot of really cool merch there. Some of it's inside jokes. Some of it's just the Script Terrain Society merch. That's a great way to support the pod and rep the pod. So go check it out. It's fun stuff. Um, you can also learn more about Chris and I and how we got started with the pod and with writing. It's all on there. Um, if you guys want to join our Patreon, you can actually join our writing group on Patreon and you don't even have to sign up. You can literally just go in there and put, put a comment about whatever it is you're working on with writing lately or what you want to talk about. Um, and on a similar note, if there's something you, you guys want us to talk about on one of our episodes that has to do with writing, you can DM us on social media or you can email us at contact at storysirenstudio.com. We will see it. We will reply. We would love to get more topics from you guys that you want us to talk about because we could definitely talk forever when it comes to writing. Or if you guys just want to chat with us um, about what it is you're working on, we want to hear it because that's what's so fun about writing groups. Uh, If you guys enjoy the pod, if you would not mind giving us a rating below, that would be fantastic. And share this with your other writer friends. We can continue to grow this little group. Um, And I think that's all I've got for you guys. So until next week, keep writing. And we'll see you on the next page.